This is a lecture video for HKIN 226, Focus on Personal Health at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, this will be one of two videos addressing the topic of weight management. Uh, in this video, I want to take a little bit of time to introduce the concept, what causes uh, weight gain and ways that we can combat weight gain. And in the second video, I will focus on uh, the sociological aspects of weight management, some eating disorders, and uh, a few more sensitive topics. Why is weight management an issue? It seems that by our best statistical guess, 61% of Canadian adults are overweight currently, and of the population in Canada, 24% are obese. And there are a variety of well-documented health concerns with that, and it seems that the trend is increasing. By 2050, we expect 70% of the population will be overweight and 50% will be obese. Half of the people in Canada will be obese uh, and suffer from the associated cardiovascular and diabetic complications. So clearly an important topic with not one uh, determinant, not one causing factor, that really sways a person in either direction. Uh, it's a multifaceted problem and it's uh, important to understand many of these facets to properly address this issue. If we think in the simplest terms, according to the laws of thermodynamics, energy balance uh, dictates that intake of calories should be equal to the output of calories and if that's the case, weight should remain the same. Bodies are really good at doing work that requires energy, but in the times that we're resting between uh, those, those times of exercise or, or whatever requires energy, uh, we store energy. We look ahead and we store energy in case we're lacking it down the road. So we're very, very good at that, and that's remained one of our hallmark traits for generations, but we are gradually decreasing the output that we engage in regularly. So we gain weight when we take in more energy than we expend, and we lose energy when the reverse is true, if we uh, take in less energy than we expend. Now the energy out part of the equation uh, is largely modifiable. We can, we can affect the physical activity that we do and push this around the 20 to 30% range. Uh, there is some energy that's required to digest food. Uh, this is often re uh, referred to as the thermic effect of food. But the biggest contributor seems to be baseline resting metabolism, the cost of just doing business on a daily basis. What does it cost to keep your body running? And we'll talk about how we can manipulate this with exercise and uh, reap benefits of this large chunk of the output equation. So when we think about weight management, weight is often a very simplistic term. It includes fat mass and fat free mass, uh, but just using weight as one specific term doesn't get at the core ideal, which for a lot of people is fat mass. It's difficult to measure fat mass in a lot of cases. Uh, fat mass can either be a problem in that you have too much of it, or for some individuals, too little. The reverse is true as well. So taking uh, a lot of these messages to the extreme can lead to some eating disorders where fat mass is critically low. Now, fat mass is stored in uh, what we call adipose tissues or fat cells throughout the body. And we've uh, separated these generally into two main depots. Subcutaneous fat is the fat that you can pinch with your fingers that's right underneath the skin. Visceral fat, on the other hand, it packs in tightly around visceral organs in your, in your abdomen, in your torso. Uh, it packs tightly around the intestines and the liver. And this is the bad guy when it comes to, to fat and fat-related complications. It seems that this is a very metabolically active organ. It secretes uh, hormone-like molecules that communicate around the body and they've been implicated in inflammation. And we start to think nowadays of obesity and diabetes as 
low-grade chronic inflammation. So we think that visceral fat might play a key role uh, at the center of that issue. Ectopic fat is often one that we don't uh, discuss. This is fat that's contained within a tissue. So your muscles will store fat in them that can be used to do work. Sometimes the liver stores fat in disease states such as fatty liver disease you see that uh, overexpression of fat storage. There certainly is some there normally and that's fine. Uh, that's considered ectopic fat, fat that's stored inside a tissue. And so uh, fat itself is difficult to assess, but we don't usually refer to it in absolute terms as far as kilograms or pounds, but we discuss percent body fat. So of our total weight, what fraction is fat and what fraction is fat free? Fat free mass, uh, while we're on the topic, is anything else. It's muscle, uh, it's liver, the non-fat part of liver, it's bone, it's sinew, it's non-fat materials. Now, a kilogram of fat we think contains around 7,000 calories. A pound of fat is about 3,500 uh, calories. And so you can think in terms of our energy balance idea that just a change of 22 calories per day, a surplus of 22 calories per day, could accumulate a kilogram of fat over a year. Similarly, a, a deficit of 22 kilocalories can help remove a kilogram of fat in a year. So interesting that it, it won't really take such drastic changes if you're willing to um, play the long-term odds. So when we think about the basic concepts of weight management, we need to understand that there are diseases associated with it, but um, I'll touch on those and want to highlight the non-obvious issues as well. So there are well-accepted, well-documented cases where cardiovascular disease is associated with increased body fat, uh, diabetes, cancer in some cases, and overall a reduction in life expectancy with an increase in body fat percentage and body fat storage. Um, even here we can think in simplistic terms. Just percent body fat gives us an idea, puts us into the ballpark for where you can expect adverse effects of disease. But distribution is probably just as important as percent body fat. Like we mentioned, visceral fat really seems to be that metabolically active fat um, that's implicated with disease, whereas subcutaneous is not. So knowing that distribution is also important. Here I'll also point out that uh, men tend to accumulate more visceral fat. Usually 10 to 20% of their fat stores are visceral, whereas in women, uh, they're luckier, they have only 5 to 8% uh, of visceral fat. And so we can get a pretty good sense of the distribution of fat by using a simple tool such as waist circumference. Visceral fat largely accumulates in the abdomen, and so a waist circumference measurement, in addition to uh, something like BMI or a body fat percentage measure, will give us an idea of how fat's distributed. Now, this distribution in fat and the associated diseases um, have drastic complications, drastic consequences. Usually, life expectancy, uh, where we can assume, is reduced by 10 to 20 years in obese individuals. So that's not overweight, that's obese. And we see that in conjunction with the cluster of other usual physical complications, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and atherosclerosis. And while those are well documented, I really want to highlight in this section that there are many other less well-known issues. There might not only be psychological issues associated with the consumption of food or with the overconsumption of food after the fact, but they might drive the consumption of food as well. The reasons for eating uh, as we all well know, are not only to sustain um, body mass or, or energy provision in the body, a lot of it makes you feel good. 
We won't spend a whole lot of time discussing ways to evaluate body composition. There are a lot of advanced tools and you'll get that in a number of different classes. Things like underwater weighing and uh, DEXA scanning or bioelectric impedance. We're going to focus mainly on some basic ones like waist circumference and even, um, even in simple terms we can get a more detailed look by comparing the waist to hip ratio. The idea being that this gives a better picture of distribution between these two extremes that we tend to notice in the population. So android obesity is typical in a lot of men. It's characterized by an apple shape with a lot of fat accumulating around the abdominal region. And uh, this usually indicates higher visceral fat. And so it has strong correlations with disease. You'll often see this phenotype with disease symptoms like high um, blood pressure and uh, atherosclerosis and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Gynoid obesity is characterized by the pear shape, which is typical of um, women more than men. It indicates more subcutaneous fat storage in the hips and thighs. And so comparing the waist to hip ratio can help us understand where along the spectrum a person is and um, how important or critical it is for them to address weight management. Incidentally here, uh, a waist circumference value that is healthy for men is uh, generally below 102 centimeters. I think that's around 40 inches and for women it's below 88 centimeters. Um, not all the way down to zero but that's the threshold where ab above this value we uh, can indicate or we can observe some negative health effects. We'll also be pretty familiar with BMI as a measure of uh, being healthy weight, underweight, or overweight. BMI is body mass, body mass index, and quite simply, it's a measure of density. It's height, or sorry, it's weight divided by height squared, so it's um, pounds per square inch or kilograms per square meter. It's a measure of density of the body. And we've stratified these numbers so that people in a healthy range are somewhere in the middle and we have varying degrees of unhealthy underweight and unhealthy overweight on either side. But importantly, as a measure of density, BMI does not differentiate between fat and fat-free mass. It's just a measure of total density. And so we will often use it with a measure of waist circumference or a measure of waist to hip ratio. To, to evaluate whether the, um, the readings that we get are true and accurate. Uh, BMI for some muscular individuals will indicate they're overweight when their body fat percentage might be quite low, and their waist circumference would help us identify that. So you can calculate this value, or you can turn to a table like this where you'll see the healthy BMI range is the swath of green in the middle, the unhealthy underweight is blue down below, and then we have varying degrees of overweight in the yellow, gray, and then the two kinds of red above. This is a little bit more detailed than the breakdown that I had on the last slide, where overweight, yes, it's between 25 and 30, and then over 30 is obese. But since the majority of the population seems to be uh, bubbling upwards in this graph, we've classified obesity differently. There are class 1, class 2, and class 3 obese categories where the gray area is class 1 between 30 and 35. Between 35 and 40 is class 2, and then above a BMI of 40 we consider class 3 obese. And these are people where um, weight management is a critical life-threatening issue. So we can start to think of why weight management might be a problem and um, the general ways that people address this. There is a lot more detail about this coming up. But generally, weight management is an issue when body image is a concern. And typically we think of negative body images in this respect, where we are dissatisfied with some aspect of our bodies. Normally, we're worried about being too heavy or having too much fat and so our negative body image says there is too much of this we should work to reduce it 
And that is generally the case for a lot of people. The large majority of the population experiences uh, that phenomenon rather than the opposite. But the opposite is equally true. Some people might take that negative body image and adhere to extremely strict guidelines, extremely strict regimens that cause them to lose a large amount of body fat. And very low levels of body fat can also be dangerous um, to a person's health and well-being. There are a whole host of reproductive, circulatory, immune system dysfunctions, and we'll talk about those in the next uh, chapter as well. So body image is simply a dissatisfaction with how the body is. Negative body image also or often will uh, encourage us or force us to change something for what we perceive as the better, but it might not actually be the better. And we, we start to get a glimpse of this with muscle dysmorphia, um, a, a situation with some bodybuilding athletes where they consider themselves skinny, flabby, not muscular, when in actual fact to any of us they would appear very muscular, well-built, etc. So uh, it's not only issues of body image that deal with fat, but also some body image issues that, that deal with uh, muscle as well. There are many different um, reasons for these varying issues that push us in one direction or another. And I want to highlight one quickly um, that might be a little counterintuitive that isn't the classical representation of weight management, being overweight and trying to lose weight. Uh, an example where low levels of body fat are uh, a threat to wellness is the female athlete triad. Three factors that often occur together due to um, behavior and perhaps improper behavior in some female athletes. This is usually um, apparent in younger athletes and it might be due to uh, teammate or coach pressures. There might, might be uh, personal expectations that the athletes heap upon themselves or high standards that they hold themselves to to remain motivated. Where over-exercising to, uh, to perform well at the sport and trying to eat sensibly often is taken to the extreme. So extreme exercising and abnormal eating cause uh, a severe loss in body weight, which leads to amenorrhea, which is lack of menstruation, and uh, hormonal effects can eventually lead to a degrading of bone tissue, so a decrease in bone density. And often, as with a lot of weight management issues, none of these um, consequences uh, are noticed by the individual. Uh, sometimes these, these, um, these behaviors are, are justified and to a certain end, here that end is performing well um, while competing. But certainly there are some negative issues that need to be addressed in a situation like this. So let's try to think about some of the key factors that cause fat accumulation or cultivation of mass. In a perfect world, really, we would have internal cues that could help manage our eating habits. We would eat for pleasure, but we would only eat enough to satisfy what our body required. Certainly, there are other factors at play that can lead to these wide swings in, in weight in the population. The first starting point is really that of genetics. Genetics plays a large role in a person's uh, ability to gain and lose body mass. Uh, this has only really been recently studied. The field of nutrigenomics uh, tries to link changes in certain genes with how they react to nutrients and how your body reacts to foods that you take in. There's some really promising and exciting research here um, where I had a prof back at the University of Guelph that uh, would advocate and was adamant for individual grocery stores where one day soon you'll be able to go into a grocery store, uh, scan somehow your genetic code through some, some sample of tissue, and then print out a list of foods that you need to have based on your genetics and that you need to avoid based on your genetics too. Lots of really cool ideas that are happening in this area. But so far, we're only 
able to say that about 25 to 40 percent of uh, an individual's tendency to store fat is due to genetics. The rest must come from modifiable factors. If genetics is the unmodifiable blueprint, everything else has to be something that we can, we can impact, uh, what we call lifestyle. So we've identified a ton of genes that are related to weight gain. No one singular gene seems to be the be-all and end-all story. Um, but we even observe this with children of obese parents. So children of two obese parents have an 80% chance of being obese themselves. Uh, also interesting in the same line of thinking, there's a really neat area of research on uh, birth weights and how birth weight might affect health later in life. And it turns out that very low and very high birth weights, abnormal birth weights, can impact disease later in life. We see um, people developing symptoms of diabetes and cardiovascular disease that aren't even uh, overweight, that don't seem to be overweight according to BMI. So there's some really interesting genetic links there. We think of this as the set point theory, where our genetics uh, peg a certain level of, of weight or body fatness, and then we can modify away from that set point by using these other factors. Physiological factors that we can modify are resting metabolic rate. This was the largest contributor to the output side of our energy balance scale. And specifically here, we use muscle mass to modify resting metabolic rate. Muscle takes a lot more energy to, uh, to maintain it than fat does. Upkeep is much more costly. And so one of the benefits of exercise training, and specifically resistance training, is the accrual of muscle mass increases resting metabolic rate and might also help uh, with increasing the output half of the energy balance equation. Hormones play a role. Uh, some hormones will necessarily increase body fat during pregnancy or during puberty. We can't really modify those a lot of the time. Uh, and there are some indications that other hormones that are secreted from fat, we talked about this with uh, visceral adipose. Fat is uh, an endocrine organ. It's constantly communicating throughout the body. Some things like leptin, which is a hormone that's been implicated in obesity, go from fat to the brain and help regulate appetite. Another one is the, the number and size of fat cells. Usually when, when children overeat or when we overeat at an early age, we increase the number of adipose cells that are able to store fat. When we lose weight, we empty these fat cells, but we don't often decrease the number of fat cells. And so that might make it more likely in future that people can put on weight faster if they have these, these depots available to store excess energy. Uh, it might mean that they accrue weight faster. It's difficult to know for sure, but that's our indication right now from, from the research. So we have already this, we've highlighted this interplay between genetics um, and lifestyle. And what, what I really like is uh, one way that the book put it, that, that genetics tend to set the tendency to being overweight or to being heavy. But the expression of the tendency really de depends on lifestyle and modifiable factors. The modifiable factors, simply put, are eating and physical activity, the input and the output sides of the energy balance scale. We know that lifestyle has to contribute, um, and it can't only be genetics, because in the past 20 years, like you see in this graph, we've seen rapid increases in the rate of people that are overweight, obese, uh, in many classes, and our genetics haven't changed in the past 20 to 30 years. It, genetics don't change that quickly. It takes thousands of years for genetics to change, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and with this rise in, in obesity in the population, there has to be some other factor. And we think that it's the easy access to food, uh, the easy access to high calorie food, and the reduced physical activity of easier jobs, uh, everyone owning a car, not walking, etc. 
so this gets at the idea of the obesogenic environment. Life is easier for people, and that's great, right? Technology helps make our life easier. But on average, it seems, some statistics say, that people will exercise maybe a total of 15 minutes a day, uh, but watch 170 minutes of t TV a day. And that, I think, typifies uh, the type of obesogenic environment that we have to deal with nowadays. There are also psychosocial factors, factors that um, are less tangible than just lifestyle and genetics, but that involve social aspects. Um, if your culture is one that relies heavily on food to bring people together, or if uh, emotion is a strong trigger for eating, then that falls under the guise or under the umbrella of psychosocial factors. Uh, simply put, food stimulates reward centers, especially fatty foods and sugary foods. This has served us well in the past because we haven't always had easy access to food. So if you found a food source like that, you wanted to continue to eat it so that your body could store it. Now, however, it becomes a problem. So emotion is tied up in eating and sometimes unacknowledged sources of stress uh, can be dealt with improperly and temporarily through eating food. Food is a way to escape from and release yourself from those negative uh, emotions and to cope with some stress because it stimulates the reward centers. We also see uh, that socioeconomic status is one psych uh, psychosocial factor that impacts obesity, where in general, and this is very general, um, it seems that people in or with higher incomes tend to be less overweight. And it could be that there's more awareness, um, you could argue that, or maybe social pressure of uh, high standings in society or access to training and counseling. Um, it's a very general, uh, very general statement, and I'm, I'm sure that there are uh, examples to the contrary, but it seems that it is linked to socioeconomic status. It could be that um, lower cost foods generally contain more preservatives and and more fat as well, which are foods that people with a lower socioeconomic status might prefer to, uh, to buy and eat. And then lastly, as you can see with the family seated around the table here, foods within your family and culture can certainly contribute to psych psychosocial factors impacting body mass gain. Um, my mom is certainly like that. We're not an Italian family by any means, but she's always trying to make sure that I've had enough to eat or there's always something on hand or uh, you want a second helping, just think about any time that you are with your grandma the last time and you'll know what I'm talking about. So that is the end of this first lecture, uh, the introduction to our chapter on weight management. In the next lecture, we'll talk about weight, weight management strategies, some things that we can do to uh, actively combat weight gain, and then we'll discuss some issues, uh, some eating disorders where those strategies are taken to the extreme.